Hey, can you see me now? <laughs> I am in Nashville and we're still like basically under quarantine. So I have no reason to put my hair on up or any makeup right. on or anything. And we were doing a video chat. So I just put on a little bit of makeup myself. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, fuck, it was just a phone call. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for your time. How are yeah. you? Doing good. Good. Doing good. Um, good times in my life right now. <laughs> it sounds say. like it. It looks like you've been a busy lady. Yeah, absolutely. So if you don't mind, let me ask you just a few questions about the show, and then I want to talk about what you've been doing since then, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, How did you and Marcelino start talking in the first place? Okay, so I was actually on um, a pen pal website. So um, the way that works is like, you know, inmates write a letter, and we send it out to the pen pal companies, and we asked them to post an ad for us so people can correspond and write to us. And so I had posted um, an ad on meetaninmate.com. And um, I don't know, I was on there for like maybe six months and I would get all kind of letters from, I mean, some of these guys were fucking creeps. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. And then, um, and then finally I got a, Mar- a letter from Marcelino and I was like, wow, this guy's different. Like just the way that he was talking and the way that he wrote me, it was just, uh, yeah, it was great. And then literally like, I only wrote him one letter. He wrote me one letter. And then next week he was down at the jail to visit me. So, so that quick before or after you met him, this is a two part question. Did you know that he had been in Missy Elliott's work it video? And were you as excited as I was to find that out? <laughs> <laughs> I actually had no idea. And it's funny because like several months down the line, he wrote me a letter and was like, yeah, you know, cause I asked him like, you know, what have you done like in your life? And like, what's some cool things you have to say or whatever about your life. And he was like, well, I did some modeling. I might've popped up in a couple of videos. And then when I had got the letter, I just kind of like, for some reason I overlooked it and I didn't even like really put two and two together until I came home from prison. And he's like, I can't believe you didn't think it was cool that I was in a music video and I was like wait a minute what you were in a music video not just any music video either that's an amazing one to be in yeah no for (laughs) sure and then I was like wow that's sexy but it's funny because I didn't even realize it when he had told me I kind of like flew over my head so yeah it doesn't look like him in the video like the hair and stuff it looked but I I was extremely excited to find that out Um, yeah (laughs) and we were watching um I know, you know, you're one of the most popular people on the show, obviously, like you have a huge following. Um, And I've talked to several um, people on the show. And you're actually the only one that I've talked to that is still with the original person they met on the show, or still living with them. So that's great. Um, Yeah, I feel like that's because Marcelino and I, um, we didn't fall in love with the idea of who we wanted the other person to be. We really like accepted each other for who we are. And then I feel like that that's what's made our relationship so successful. And I thought it was amazing when you guys were at the hotel and he put that dress out for you. And we were all thinking, <laughs> God, that's a hideous dress. And then you when you, know it was I so still, sweet. Yes, I still <laughs> have the dress in my closet. I've never worn it. However, I plan on uh, wearing it for Halloween this year. I'm going to be a little pinup doll. <laughs> And I'm gonna post pictures. I think it's a really good idea. It's it was a super sweet gesture, but that was just yeah. funny. Like, do I think it's sweet? Yes. Would I ever pick that dress out? No. no. And I was like, she said what we were all sitting here thinking. Um. So did how did you guys get to be on the show? Did they approach? Who did they approach? Did they approach him? Did they approach you? Well, it's he. Okay, so I was like maybe a month away from being released from prison, and I called him one night. And he was like, babe, you're never going to believe what show I just saw. The first season had just aired and he had told me about it. And I was like, wow, that's a trip. That's crazy. And um, he was like, well, you know, they're, they're looking and they're casting for other couples. And I think that you and I have like such a great story to share. And so I was like, well, fuck it. Like, let's do it. Like, you know, email them or do whatever it is that you want to do. And like, let's just see if they're interested in hearing our story. And so they were super interested. I did phone call interviews from the prison and they just, I guess they just liked what I had to say. And, um, the minute I got out of prison, they were there. 
cameras and everything. Was that overwhelming? <laughs> you looked a little overwhelmed like, going into the hotel and everything when you said, can I, you know, change my clothes? Like before we were in the yeah, because we had already been filming for hours. Like I woke up at five o'clock in the morning. I went and, you know, pr- last prison shower, got dressed, um, all that, all that good stuff. I was just so excited to just get out and see Marcelino, but I was overwhelmed because I had been locked up for so long and I wanted to do right. I I didn't want anything to go wrong. And I knew that I was getting ready to have to deal with Tito plus the cameras, trying to get my son back, starting a new relationship. So I was extremely overwhelmed. And then plus meeting my new parole officer, wondering if he was going to be an asshole or not. Um, Did you have to tell him about the show? The parole officer? Uh, I, well, I did because the cameras were outside the parole office when uh, when I got there. And the lieutenant came out and was like, you guys do not have permission to be on this premises filming. And I got stuck. I was like shell-shocked because, you know, in a way it was kind of like I, I was having like an institutionalized moment. Mm-hmm. Because a cop is like, you guys are not allowed to do anything. And I froze, you know. And Marcelino was like, you don't have to listen to this motherfucker anymore. <laughs> You're coming with me. Like, let's go and let these and let the camera crew deal with the fucking lieutenant because that's their problem, not ours. So and then we had, you know, even though I had taken like a shower in prison before I even got released, I still wanted when we got to the hotel, I just wanted to like wash prison off of me. You know what I mean? Like, because it feels it's just prisons are such a nasty place. Such a dark. How long had you been there? Two years, but I had just finished serving five years. So, so when you walked out of that prison and the camera saw you, you had been in there for five years. I had been in there for two years, but I had oh. just finished serving a five-year bid before I did that two years. And you walk out after two years to cameras and your boy, yeah. new boyfriend, husband, slash, yeah. oh, wow. Yeah, and it was uh, it was outrageous. <laughs> That's a lot. Um, do you feel like you? Were, I have asked everyone I've talked to about like this. Do you feel like you were edited fairly on the show? Um, you know what? Okay, so th- the part about editing, you have no control over that. But if you just stay true to yourself, then it doesn't matter how they edit you because you can only look like an asshole if you act like an asshole. <laughs> you know, you can, you can only look like a dirtbag if you're legitimately being a dirtbag. And you know, I don't. I, I don't know. So that's, I mean, that's just my take on it. I feel like I've been true to myself and remained completely transparent throughout this whole process. Yeah. And so, you know, there's are, that. Are we going to see you on the show again or are you guys done with it? Maybe. <laughs> yeah, to stay tuned. <laughs> we will. <laughs> so since then, you mm-hmm. have written your book. Wow. That. Yeah. It's amazing that you're alive. Yeah. It's. And then like I'm working on the sequel right now. And that one actually has like my life. Like it's crazy. Like what led me to jail, what I served my time for just everything. And like that book is even deeper than the first one. Like it's, it's a lot. I couldn't fit everything that I've been through in life in one book. So I was like, what better idea than to just write a trilogy, you know? So So you wrote and published the book yourself. Yeah. I self published, um, through Amazon. Was that hard to do? Um, actually, no, it was easy. You know, the hardest part about writing a book is actually just getting your manuscript done. If people would just like, you know, people that want to write a book, if they would just actually focus and get what they need to get on paper done, then everything else is a cakewalk from there. You know, you send your book out to get professionally edited, which, you know, isn't cheap, but it's not really that expensive either. And it's completely free to self publish. So, you know, and which is funny because, you know, you would think that like, perhaps because I'm on a reality show that people would be to get me on, um, uh, was I thinking? to give me a publishing deal or whatever. And it just wasn't the case. And so I was like, let me, you know, uh, just do this on my own. And it feels like so much more gratifying. That's amazing. So you don't have, you didn't have to answer to anybody and you get, you get all the money (laughs) pretty much. Right. Because you did it all yourself. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So can I ask you about some things in the book? Is that okay? Yeah, sure. So I was just floored by this, and I have some stuff written down I want to ask you, so forgive me for looking at my notepad here. 
Um, so the gentleman, when did you get the idea to do the book to begin with? Like, is this something you'd been thinking about for a while or had people I've been told wanting you? to write a book since I was in prison and I had started it a few times, but then finally, like when I, okay, so this is, I have always wanted to write a book. And when I came home and I filmed the first season of the show and I got such a great response from the public on social media about how just the little tidbit of information about my life that I've shared has helped so many people. I was like, fuck, maybe I really do need to write a book because if people hear about my life experience and see that I am successful today, maybe it'll help them know that they can get through it as well. You know? Yeah. Um, I mean, I was just floored by, by some of the details of this. And I, um, yeah. so the guy in the book that you refer to as your father was actually your stepfather. Gil, is that correct? Gil, yeah, He's that's my stepfather. stepfather. Yeah. And have you ever had contact with your biological father? Um, actually, that's funny that you asked because I haven't seen him since I was, since before I can even remember. And when I was first incarcerated at the age of 18, um, everybody sort of kind of like left me. Like my stepdad, my mom, my family, my friends, nobody was there to support me at all. And I had um, ran into a girl and I was talking to her about my real dad and how I don't know him and how maybe if I had a life with him instead of my mom, maybe I would be different. Maybe I would have never went to prison. And um, she was like, well, maybe I can help you get in contact with your dad. And so I gave her the only information that I had about him, that he lived in Florida and his name. And she reached out and came back with a with an address and I wrote them and I was like I don't know if this is who I'm looking for but um I'm trying to find my dad and it's my name this is my sister uh this is my mom did I gave as much information as I could and it ended up being my real dad and his mom my grandmother Judy actually wrote me back and you know we had they were supportive of me my entire first incarceration and then things kind of like fell off and then my grandmother passed away and then I stopped hearing from my real dad again. And so we have reconnected since then. Um, but I still haven't like met him in person and that's something I'm hopeful of doing uh, soon. Does he watch the show? Uh, yeah, he actually just started watching it and he reached out and he was like, I cannot believe you're on that's television. So <laughs> yeah. What a crazy so. way to, if he's never met you, to kind of get to know you a little bit. Like, that's yeah. insane. Um, so you had a lot of trauma at a young age. What? How long did you go to school? Because it starts out with, okay. what grade did you complete? Stop. Seventh. This is my dog. Can you hear? Hey, stop. <laughs> Cut it out. Cut it out, you big animal. Okay. Um, well, actually, um, I completed the seventh grade and then that was the last time I had ever went to school until I was in prison and I ended up getting my GED. And when I was released from prison, I actually ended up going to college for a few years. So that's amazing because you're so well-spoken. And I was thinking about that when I was yeah, reading I mean, the book. I never ever went to high school, not one day in my life. Cause I thought there's no way she could be going to school through all this. Like that's, I mean, you, no. it was crazy. <laughs> I don't want to, um, so I have never been to Las Vegas. Is that where you live now? Yes. And it's hot as <laughs> fuck already. <laughs> there is this crappy little town. I live in Nashville, Tennessee, like I said, and there's this okay. crappy little town where you gamble at Tunica, Mississippi. That's like three hours from here. And yeah. I went with a friend one time who was obviously of age and her ID was expired and they yeah. would not let her in the casino to gamble. How were you getting into casinos and gambling at 12? I have literally only been ID'd and carded out here maybe five times in my entire life. And I'm 29 now. And um, it's funny because I've done other interviews and I keep forgetting that I'm 29. So I keep saying I'm 28. <laughs> but I am 29. I'm going to be 30 this year. And I have literally only been carded like maybe five times. Seriously, I and don't know. They didn't. Did you look twelve, and you were just hanging out? Because I could no, not imagine. Well, the thing is, the thing is, is when you're out here in Vegas, as long as you don't like ask the the waitresses or go to an actual like table and say like, oh, I would like to play blackjack or can I order a drink, they won't fuck with you. You can be sitting there gambling on the machines. You can have a friend bringing you drinks all, all you want. And as long as you don't make personal contact with them, then they don't, they just don't fuck with you. So 
That is crazy because I have never been policed more than I've. And if there were casinos yeah. in Nashville, I'll tell you, I would have a real probably problem because, because I love it. Small, yeah, probably because it's such a small uh, little casino area. You know? Yeah, I mean, they were. I mean, I, and I was like, "Are you fucking kidding me? Like, you didn't your IDs expired, and we're about to have to like." Then you're sitting outside because I'm going in. Like, we just drove three hours to get here, and it was like a girls' weekend and everything. But, <laughs> you're um, sitting inside. <laughs> yeah, like I'm sorry, that was dumb of you. But I, when I was reading that, I thought I have never been like that's the the most strict I've ever seen people. So yeah. Las Vegas is different, I guess, mm-hmm. or it was then. So when you were 12, that was. I can't do fucking math. So that was 17 years ago. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Got it. Um, so there were a lot of men in your life that were v- very predatory. Um, yeah. And did that make you, has it made you have issues like just being tr- distrustful of men in general as you've gotten older? And have you had to um, like, well, actually, uh, that's what like caused me to start dating women to begin with. And that's something else that I'm going to be talking about in my second book. After dealing with Jeremy for so many years and the sexual trauma and the abuse that he put me through, um, I just couldn't stand the thought of like having a boyfriend or being with a man. In fact, it terrified me and it disgusted me, to be honest. And so I had started dating women and then that, uh, you know, I was dating women on the streets and then I ended up going to prison I was dating women in prison. And then like throughout my journey of uh, trying to find acceptance for my past and let it go, I finally one day realized that I cannot put the actions of other, I can't hold new people in my life accountable for the actions of others because then they'll never stand a chance to begin with. And when I was released from prison the first time, that's when I met Tito. And so um, that was obviously my second relationship with a man ever. And that didn't turn out so well either. <laughs> but, yeah. But what you went through without getting too, like, gr- I mean, it had to have given you some really fucked up feelings about what sex was supposed to be like. Like, yeah. as an adult and stuff, that had to have been hard to deal with and get yeah. over like you would just think reading that I would just think I would never want to be touched again by a man if well, I went through yeah, that. that's how that's exactly how I felt but there was like this process that I was going through where I didn't want to harbor those feelings anymore I didn't want to feel ashamed anymore I didn't want to feel embarrassed or disgusted about myself or I didn't want to blame myself anymore and so I literally had to face everything that that man did to me and just be okay with it and accept the fact that that was his doing and his actions don't define my character instead of walking around carrying that on my shoulder and my back all the time. And once I was able to let it go, you know, I was able to like realize that like that's that's a raw like how do I explain it? It's not what sex is supposed to be. You know, it's supposed to, you know, it, you share intimacy with somebody that you love and it's on a completely different level versus, you know, the sexual abuse I went through with him. He's a pedophile. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I'm sorry you went through that. And it's very brave of you to tell that story. I'm sure it's helped anybody that's gone through something like that. I hope so. And that was the whole point of me wanting to just get it out there. Before you met Jeremy, you were, what is the name of the, of the guy that you were, it starts with a CH and I, I don't want to mispronounce it, that you were hanging out with, um, and living with. And so, oh, yes. So yeah. you were driving around Las Vegas and slinging dope at 12. Yeah. Yeah. Did your clients think that was odd that this 12 They didn't girl- care. They didn't care. From the time I was 12 to the time I was 18, I had a meth addiction. And the first person to introduce me to that was an adult. Everyone that I ever met in those six years throughout my addiction had no problem smoking dope with me, giving me dope, showing me how to commit crimes so we can make money to get more dope. Like, no one, not one adult ever in all of those years, had a problem with the fact that I was a child. None of them. That's insane. And you would just spend me too, because now that I'm adult and I and I think about it, I'm like, fuck! If some kid came around me like 
you know, just wanting to smoke fucking weed or drink or whatever. I'm like, I'm not going to support that shit. You and know? drove up in their own Toyota or whatever kind of car. I think that's yeah. what you said they gave you. And you're just dry. I mean, that's insane to me. And that no one ever pulled you over or anything and, and thought like it just looks weird that I mean, you had no. to have looked very young and, and right. nobody ever gave you any shit like. No, no. Cra- were you scared? Uh, I was too high to be scared. I think I was that's too high wrong. to wow. feel anything. That's- so crazy so you finally left that situation and then that is where how did you meet jeremy um so he was actually dealing drugs at this apartment or hotel and he was security guard there and i didn't have anywhere to go i don't want to give out too many details of the book but i didn't really have anywhere to go and i met this guy downtown who introduced me to him and um it kind of went from there. So, so do you think without giving up, do you think that you were the first, how old was he and how old were you? Um, I was about to be 13 and he was like 29, almost 30. And do you think that he had been with other young girls before you? Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Wow. You know, And there were periods, again, without giving too much about it, where the two of you were, you were actually outside homeless, like sleeping outside in the park. Oh, yeah. Literally outside, like on a blanket on the ground for months and months. And several of those months I was pregnant. So. And you said something in the book where he would, he advised you to get a pregnancy test. And you said Mm -hmm. you didn't know how you would know you were pregnant. And I guess that's because you weren't with your mother or anyone, a female to tell you those things. I mean, it's sad, but no one, I, no one ever taught me like, you know, like what it means to be pregnant or what goes, you know, what you have to, like your body goes through or how to find out if you're pregnant or how to get prenatal care or what that even means. And no one, no one had ever like, uh, invested the time to teach me, you know, things or how to become a young woman or just anything. How do you feel about Jeremy today? Um, I don't know how to, that's a good question. (laughs) That's a good question. Um, I don't know, because sometimes I thought to myself, like, if I would see him, like, what would I say? Because I wouldn't be like, you owe me an apology, because even if you said sorry, that doesn't, it wouldn't mean shit to me, you know? And, you know, like, would I tell him to, like, fuck off? Probably, I don't know, probably, probably not, because it's like, I, I don't know. I feel like he deserves to do jail time, but it's like, you know, the statutory limits and all that other shit. Like, it doesn't. Is he incarcerated know. right now? No, he's out on parole. You're very clever at the end of your book because I've looked into writing some things, too, and I know that you can't you have to use images or whatever and get permission. But what you used as his image is public domain, I'm assuming, because it was. his. It so if you buy the book, you get to see what this guy looks like and his whole rap sheet and. Yeah. Everything. And mm-hmm. that was really interesting to see. Um, so he's not incarcerated yeah. right now? No, he's out on parole right now. And you, have you had any contact with him? And when's the last time you had contact with him? Um, when he was being arrested when I was 17 and pregnant with his second child. Wow. 16, 17, I can't remember. The, the days get fuzzy sometimes. <laughs> And when we last saw you on the show, you were trying to get in touch with the children that um, you had put up for adoption. You had two children with him. Yeah, you know, I, you know, there's been a lot of controversy over that on social media. And I'm just somebody who like, you know, everyone's entitled to their opinion. That's fine. I want to find my other children because I don't want them to think that like I left them or I don't love them or I don't care about them. I'm not trying to uproot them from the home where they've been raised. I'm not trying to cause more damage because I know what it feels like to not have my real parent in my life. My, I didn't, I haven't seen my dad since I was a little girl and I've always dreamed about meeting him one day. I wondered, does he love me? Like, was he looking for me? Does he care that we're not together? And so because I've had those questions and those those feelings inside, I know that they do, too, you know, and I never like consciously said, oh, I love dope more than them. It wasn't like that. I was a child on drugs and didn't know how not to be on drugs. 
you know, you have grown adults who don't know how to get sober. So imagine a child being taken over by methamphetamines. It's it's a, it's a fucking ruthless drug. You know, and I it, will and head it, in here and say anyone who's listening to this, this book is fucking insane. What you went through yeah. as a child, like by the book, yeah. it is crazy. Thank so I'm you. sorry, but and I don't mean that. Like, and I know if I am, I'm not making light of your story, or, or I'm making it. Or making it, se- I feel like I'm making it seem entertaining. It's tragic, and but yeah. I was, but I it's just put it the down. truth. People go through things like this sometimes, and it's hard for people to talk about. And I don't want it to be a hard conversation anymore. I want people to be like, okay, this is the fucked up shit I went through in life. This is what I've done to over, you know, overcome those things, and this is where I'm at today. And it's okay that you talk about it. It's okay that these things happened, you know, as long as you've learned from it and you share your experience to help others, you know. When you had the children in the hospital, did you not have to put a father down on the birth certificate? And at that point, did someone not look into him for being a pedophile? You know, that's the craziest thing ever. I did put his name on both of the birth certificates and no one ever, ever was like, wait a minute, this teenager is having children by this grown man no one ever said anything and then when the kids went into custody and i was in prison and i couldn't um, do my case plan to get them because i had so much time to serve they tried to give the kids to him and that was going to be my next question yeah they tried to give the kids to him and he was in jail doing his case plan or whatever but when he got out of jail he went off and started doing drugs and you know became unresponsive and so the children ended up being adopted so have you had any any progress in getting in touch with them or finding out anything about whether their parents now would be open to you no not yet but it's a process and it's a journey that i'm on so and do you have to get his permission for any of that? Fuck no. Okay. Fuck, Fuck no. <laughs> That's fucking good. <laughs> um, so, yeah. it, in the book, you go back and forth between a lot of, like, your situation at home is not great, and you kind of go back and forth between some situations. And to other girls that have a a home life like you did and then you it was like you were trying to choose between a bad situation and a worse one like what advice would you give to girls that are that are going through that do you think that you should have stayed home or do you think that it was right to leave sometimes that's a really um difficult question because i don't want to say like what is right for who you know and um i just you know, I, I'm actually working, I have a lot of things like working in progress right now, because my advice would be to reach out uh, for outside help. Um, but it's like, who do you reach out to? And right now I'm working on a few things um, to answer that question, you know, to help. I saw where you're, you're you know, working on a charity for young girls that are homeless or, or something on your well, Instagram. It's not- Uh, It's not necessarily a charity. Um, I've actually got a few different things going on right now. Um, I have um, an online webinar membership that's going to be available soon to the community. Um, And then I'm trying to open up a transitional home for women that are getting out of prison. Um, I'm also, uh, I want to be the answer, you know, that uh, when young women are going through the similar situation that I did and they need help, I want to be that person that is able to like step in and help them. And I'm not sure exactly what that platform looks like yet, but I'm working it out. Okay. That's, that's, you've, you've taken, you've done amazing taking such a, a trauma and turning around to, you seem you. like you're living a very positive life. Um, and that's wonderful. That's why people are, are, have rooted from you from the beginning. What was different this time getting out of jail? Because, oh, you know, this time it was, uh, so when I went to prison at 18 years old, I had to grow up in prison. I had to mature and become a young adult in, in prison. And so when I got released from prison, I didn't really know, I didn't have an example of success to follow on the streets. I didn't know how to get acclimated back into society. I didn't know how, and then, you know, Giovanni's father, Tito, was the second, you know, um, 
the second relationship I had ever really been in with a man. And I didn't know how not to be codependent upon him. I didn't have those like those life skills. And I, you know, so it's like, I didn't know how not to be a follower. I guess I would say I didn't know how not to be a lot of things because I didn't have an example of success to follow. And so because of that, um, you know, one thing led to another, um, and it led me back in prison. But my second time in prison, I honestly became very bitter and I was very angry and I blamed everyone and I was not in a good place in my life because I knew the first time when I came out, I tried so hard to succeed. And I feel, I feel like everyone kind of like threw me away. Like the judges threw me away. My family threw me away. I just kind of feel like no one ever like tried to invest time into me to help me succeed. And so I was bitter about it. But then I realized I have to take accountability for my own life. I have to be responsible, you know, for my part in my life. And then that helped like me start to turn over a new leaf. Um, And I did everything possible to just teach myself the life skills, whether it was through classes, whether it was through mentally stimulating books, whether it was through, I used to meditate, I used to work out. I just, I did so many things in prison to try to better myself and just learn from everything. And so now this time what's so different is um, I just have the coping skills to deal with situations. Um, I know like what my triggers are. I know my boundaries. I know how to have healthy relationships instead of codependent relationships. I mean, there's the list is on and on, but to sum it up, that's that's where I'm at. (laughs) How is your relationship with your mother now? And was it difficult to forgive her? Um, you'll, the relationship with my mother is going to always be a work in progress. I've come to realize, but as far as like how we're doing today, you're going to have to stay tuned for that. How about Gil? Um, Gil, we have an excellent relationship. Actually, he has completely like changed his life. He's doing so well for himself. And what I admire about him so much is that it hurt him to see what me and my older sister, Sarah, who we don't really talk about on the show, but she is in my book. It hurt him so bad to see like what her and I went through that he changed his life so he could raise my three younger sisters um, to be, you know, young ladies and just responsible and all of that stuff. And even though it took him a while to get it together, he finally did when I was about 19, 20 years old and I was going through my first incarceration, so... And how is Beverly? Beverly is good. good. She, Yeah, she's good. Um, she does not wish to be a part of the show, and I have to respect that. Um, but she's she's doing good, and so is, uh, so is my grandpa Fred. Good. And are your parents still married? Mine? No, they're not. No. Okay. They're not together. They're <laughs> separated, <laughs> and it's chaos. So. And are you in touch with Sarah now? Um, I do talk to Sarah. She's actually in Florida with our real dad. And um, so that's another reason why I'm like, okay, like if I go to Florida, you know, of course, after like coronavirus is kind of like calmed down, maybe there's a vaccine, I feel safe traveling. Um, Then maybe I'll go out there and rekindle a relationship with my older sister, um, you know, reunite with my father. That's what my hope is. So if Jeremy were to approach you and try to have a relationship with you to on behalf of the children to kind of reach out or something would you would you be open to that or is that something you don't know about i would probably punch him in the face i think that's an <laughs> excellent answer <laughs> i think it would probably punch him in the face and it, uh, things would not be a good look so um you talk about your father in the book having a gambling addiction and from what we've seen about Marcelino he's an excellent husband excellent guy does it make you nervous what the fucker likes to gamble (laughs) (laughs) does that make you nervous um so you know in the beginning it, it made me nervous and then after we had like the financial troubles since then um Marcelino and I has have kind of like hashed our differences out I've explained to him like where I where I stand on that and you know he's really put forth an, a good effort to stick to his budget and then um you know not really hide things from me any longer you know and then what 
you know, then the coronavirus happened. So it's not like he could really go out and gamble anymore <laughs> anyways. So that's nice. <laughs> so. And how are Zoila and Giovanni? Oh, my God. The kids are doing amazing. Zoila is, she's like a breath of fresh air. She's running all over the place. And I'm always dressing her up on all these cute little outfits and um, Gio, he's becoming quite the young man, and it kind of makes me sad because I want him to stay little forever. <laughs> Very adorable. Your family's beautiful. Thank you so much. And tell us the name of your book and where we can find it and where we can find all the stuff. Okay, so the name of my book is One Woman's Journey, Surviving the Streets. You can find it um, on Amazon. It's available as a paperback or um, on Kindle. And if you would prefer to actually buy it directly from me, because I can't go, um, I can't go on a book tour right now because of coronavirus. So what I'm doing is people that reach out to me on my Instagram, which is at Brittany.LoveAfterLockup, can reach out to me through a direct message and um, I will ship a book signed straight to them. Awesome. Well, yeah. thank you so much for talking to me today. I'm so excited. I'm so excited to see what comes next. Um, can you yes. record a little something for me right now to post just saying like hi to the listeners and we're going to yes. talk whatever you want to say. Go for it. Okay. <laughs> hi, everyone. Um, it's Brittany from Life After Lockup. I'm so excited to be here with Lily today. And I just really hope that you enjoy this podcast. <laughs> Thank you, Brittany, and thank you for your time. That was amazing, and um, I can't wait to read your next book and see what comes next for you. you we so want to see more of you and your All lovely right. family. All the best. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Yes, thank you so much. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.